in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. As we continue in song, the Lamb of Glory. stretching. I don't give you the musical score up there. We're not used to it. Uh, most folks have told me they like singing off the wall. I like it because I can see your faces, even if you're looking over there. Works for me. Uh, I like it because your heads are up and voices project better when heads are up. Uh, but I miss parts and I miss the ability to sing something that's less familiar and have the music up. Uh, they, they make PowerPoint slides with the musical score. Maybe we can find some of those that work in our given situation. But um, uh, when we see the things that are, sing the things that are sort of familiar, well, sometimes it shows. Um, if you take your bulletin, uh, we'll take a peek at the announcements found therein. Evening service tonight at 6 o'clock. Uh, we're downstairs. Uh, we'll be spread out around those many tables. Uh, the nice thing is when we do pie and praise, if the Lord lets us do pie and praise uh, ahead of Thanksgiving, we won't have to add any tables to the mix really down there. Uh, we've got a bunch already. Uh, but uh, we're out and around the table. We're going to continue our study in Acts. Although, if my dad gets here in time and you see him, you're expecting him to preach tonight. That's the way you're to play it. Just saying. Um, I wouldn't do that to him. He's actually he's, he's going to Pennsylvania uh, to hunt with family and then to western New York to see my brother and his family and his old church where he ministered for 27 years and uh, thought he was retired from. Uh, but he unretired up in Maine and now the church back in Allegheny, New York is pastorless. Uh, they called a much, much, much younger man and he got ill and had to retire and resign from the ministry there. Uh, so they're really struggling and uh, they are delighting to have Pastor Heyman, the elder, speak to them next Sunday. So. He doesn't get next week off, so I'll give him this evening off if he's able to get down here in time. Uh, but we are going to rejoin our study in the book of Acts at the tail end of chapter 5 and really uh, starting into chapter 6. Looking forward to that. Ladies' Bible study, Tuesday morning at 10. Uh, ladies, mark your calendar. 
quarterly business meeting Thursday night at 7. We're back here uh, at church, uh, I believe. Uh, obviously, the parking lot work, a lot of it's been done, but there's work left to do. They need to come and recoat some things and then to paint the lines. Lord willing, that gets done this week. If we have to change schedule, I'm afraid I'm going to have to let you know because right now I don't know their schedule. And uh, he's probably like me. He's getting frustrated with the weather forecast. A, it's got too much rain in it. I know we need it. But you'll forgive me if I don't, if I, if it, I pray that it would wait a month. That's how I am. That's anyway, it's the roofer in me. Uh, but um, I'll just be in prayer that the parking lot gets done and, and takes well. And uh, we'll have to communicate by email or otherwise uh, if anything gets interrupted this week. Uh, for instance, if we had to go back on Zoom only for prayer meeting. Uh, it's funny, I forgot how to do all those things uh, to be at home on Zoom. It turns out it's a whole other thing for me to do Zoom from home. I ended up on Kim's computer to pull that off. But um, uh, we had a good group Thursday night at our Zoom only prayer meeting. But we're hopefully both prayer meeting and, or both in person and on Zoom on Thursday. Um, Friday morning there is, or you are going to Sturbridge Village. All right. So that rain pushed it to next week. Uh, Friday at 10, Pilgrim Homeschoolers Group are meeting in Old Sturbridge Village. Saturday at noon, there is no more meeting at Kate Angeles. If you missed it, you missed it. Uh, it sounds like the ladies had a lot of fun uh, playing in the fire, eating good food, and um, shivering in the cold. But uh, it sounds like they had a good old time there yesterday. Glad for it. Uh, note that October 31st is sneaking up on us, and you need to change your clocks that night. Uh, November 1st, we'll have communion in the evening service. And we're going to be collecting food for our Thanksgiving basket starting next week. And uh, please leave your canned or dry goods in the box in the foyer. Or if you want to give money to Hector, a number of folks do that. Uh, that allows us to buy turkeys and other things that, are, uh, that we don't have, uh, fresh vegetables, that sort of thing. And we're grateful for everybody and their part in that. We've been able to help a lot of families through the years uh, with those Thanksgiving baskets. And we thank you for your uh, investment in that. You see the nursery and children's church schedules there at the bottom, and uh, we thank all of you for your service downstairs to let service upstairs happen well, too. I believe that's it for announcements. At this time, uh, Kareth is going to minister in song and pay special attention to the words. Listen to
you saved me from my sin. Encourage me to share my faith and give me peace within. Lord, let my heart be open. Remind me of that joy and through that joy tell others so they may know you more. Let me speak clear and true, comforting to others, focusing on you, showing others your love in everything I do, knowing we are not alone, believing now in you. much for that. Um, let me share your word. Comforting to others, focusing on you. Yeah. You'll have to ask her sometime who wrote that. Steve, I don't know if it was, it was just while the, whatever you did when she started playing the piano, it really started hissing in this speaker of mine, so you know. And then I was coming back on myself a little from this mic. So anyway, just so as you know. Uh, if you would join me in Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2. I hope you're still, oh, I'm sorry, children are dismissed to junior church at this time. It's funny that I forget it because it's some of the most fun I have all day. Watching those kids go is always fun. It just is. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Second Thessalonians. We're talking about the day of the Lord. We're calling this part two, the man of lawlessness. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, day of the Lord and what all that entails and means. Uh, we're going to speak up front about why he's talking about it. And um, frankly, why he's talking about it again in some respects. It's part of why our scripture reading this morning was in 1 Thessalonians to remind us that he's been on the end times uh, subject with them. Uh, very, there's very little time, uh, a month or two maybe, between the two letters. Uh, so he's very recently spoken to them by the written word, and here he is bringing it up again. And uh, why is that? Well, largely that's because they were in the midst of confusion. Uh, they were confused. Some of that is, um, Proverb tells us that in a multiple a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. Uh, I have a short list. I haven't really, you know, um, sat down to number it. Uh, it's gotten shorter over the years. There's probably three or four pastors that I call when I'm stuck. I call when I'm hurting. I call when I need help. You might figure my dad's top of that list, and he is. Uh, but I kind of, to be honest, I kind of have, I, I, call, I call, try to call the specialist in what my problem is, if, if you know what I mean. Let's, let's talk like we're talking about doctors for a minute. You know, there's general practitioners and then there's specialists, and uh, we have a whole lot of specialties these days. And part of that is I know pastors that are just, their interpersonal skills are just wonderful. They have a pastor's heart, they love their people, and they seem to know how to put out the little fires that happen between church members. Uh, they seem to know uh, how to handle something and even to deal with sin without igniting more sin and, and inciting people to rebellion. 
Uh, and so there's one man in particular that, that's in our fellowship that I call when those sorts of things are on my heart. There's other men that are tremendous in the, in the Bible languages and their Greek and their Hebrew skills are off the charts. And so when I'm really hung up on a word or a passage, they're the men I call. Uh, some of them about how to administrate in the church and what the proper way is to handle something uh, of business, if you will, in the church. And we call people like that. Now, uh, somebody has written to the Thessalonians, evidently, and put Paul's name on a letter. That's brought a lot of confusion. So the Bible does say in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom. But there's also the indication that in a multitude of voices there's confusion. If we're going to look everywhere for truth and give every, everybody and everything equal, equal play, this could be true, that could be true, we can get really confused really quickly, can't we? And so it, for me, it, it really boils down to this truth that you speak of, does it coordinate with God's word? Does it correlate to the very word of God? Because the pre, we all live by presuppositions. We have to. We, there's no, we don't function without them. And the greatest presupposition of my life is this, God's word is true. Scripture says of itself it was breathed out by God. If God is perfect, and he is, sinless, and he is, all-knowing, and he is, then anything that comes out of him has to be perfect and sinless and all-knowing. Not only that, but because it's the very breath of God, it carries weight. It is authoritative. Thus saith the Lord. And so as I look for truth, this is my be-all and end-all in my grip right here, the Word of God. What has God said? And so the Thessalonians, some of them, you know, I, I have a background as a school teacher, and sometimes I, I look at that and I think every pastor ought to do that for a few years. They just, I learned so many things from my students, I can't tell you. One of the things I learned is, is you've got, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Jimmy and John, no offense to any Jims and Johns around, but they're sitting in the front row. If they're in the front row of Mr. Ha Mr. Heyman's class, that's because Mr. Heyman doesn't trust them anywhere further back. And he got them right in the front row because that's where we really hope to keep the eye contact and keep them right with us. But you know what happens? Is Jimmy doesn't listen to the instructions for the assignment at all. His mind is someplace else. And instead of coming to Mr. Heyman and saying, Mr. Heyman, I'm sorry I missed that. Oh, really, what part? Well, all of it instead of having that awkward conversation, instead of going and talking to Jill, and Jill is, I mean, she is the class president, and she pays attention, and she gets straight A's, and she's on the ball. Instead of coming to the teacher, or going to Jill, who certainly heard every word and could repeat it verbatim, who does he go to? Well, Jim goes to Johnny, the only kid who paid less attention than he did. Isn't that how it works? And so when Jim takes Johnny's advice, utter confusion ensues. And they both come in and they've, mm -hmm, they've really made a mess of whatever the project was supposed to be. This is what was happening in Thessalonica. People were confused about their end time views. They were confused by some things that Paul said that they didn't understand in their context. They were confused because they were hearing many different voices. They were confused because they were counting on each other and none of them were really quite getting it, it seems. And so Paul really has to set some things straight here. And this is one of those passages where he very much does that. Um, God wants his people to know what's going to happen. Uh, he doesn't leave us without instruction. He doesn't leave, with, leave us without prophecy. Prophecy is a wonderful thing. And in the Old Testament times, and today as well, but in the Old Testament times, God specified any prophecy that was not 100% accurate was not from God. God's prophet was right about everything all the time. That's pretty astounding when you think about it. It also, I, I saw one commentator that put this in a way I hadn't thought of it before. You've heard me talk a lot about near and far prophecy. 2 Samuel 7, God is making a covenant with David. And he says to David, I'm going to bring up a, one of your sons after you and make a king and make him a king and so forth, and he's going to rule. Well, the near part is he's talking about Solomon and all that Solomon was going to accomplish on his earthly time as the ruler of Israel. Pretty impressive. But by the end of the passage, he's using things to describe, he's using words and, and talking about holiness and, 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 and righteousness and eternity. Solomon wasn't holy, Solomon wasn't righteous, and Solomon's been dead for thousands of years. 
the end of that passage is clearly talking about Jesus Christ. And in the New Testament, Jesus brings up some of that passage about himself. So we know it was talking about Christ. There's the near and the far. Part of the reason there is the near term prophecy is to prove the authenticity of both prophecies, near and far. Because the one in the future was so far in the future, none of them were ever going to live long enough to see the proof. But there were other things that happened in their generation or the next where it was very close and it could be measured and seemed to be the true word of God. Today our focus is going to be on mostly on the person of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, but it's also going to be on the great deception at the end of time and what that means and why that comes. So let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord's wisdom as we look at his word together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you so much that you didn't leave us without instruction. Thank you so much that you didn't leave us without any sense of where we came from or where we're going, but that, Lord, in your word, you've given us all of that. We thank you, Lord, that you haven't left us to figure it out on our own, but you've given us, Lord, the, the church to help us, but so much more than that, you've given us the Holy Spirit within us to open our hearts, to direct us to your word, and to help us, Lord, to understand it as we have the very author of Scripture living within us as believers. What a wonderful blessing that is. Please, Lord, do open our hearts. Help us open our minds. Help us to understand this passage. Help us to make application of it in our daily lives and in our plans from here on out. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The man of lawlessness. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, that is, the day of the Lord, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord has been prophesied in Scripture uh, all through the, prof the prophetic part of the Old Testament. It talks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is, can be somewhat confusing to people, and there's some disagreement even among believers, because in some ways it's very positive, and in other ways it's very negative. For the believer, the day of the Lord is wonderful because it speaks of the return of Christ to earth. We delight in that. We know him. We know what he did for us. He, he's, we're joint heirs together with him. It's a pretty wonderful arrangement we have and relationship that we have with him. And so for the believer, there's a wonderful nature to the return of Christ. To the unbeliever, to the ungodly, to those who have thumbed their nose at God, uh, it's a time of terrible destruction, a time of terrible pain and agony. Uh, it's a very negative thing. The day of the Lord has, is used broadly of the return of Christ. And here I think it's being rather specific to the tribulation period, the seven-year literal tribulation period after the rapture. We read it in 1 Thessalonians this morning uh, that, um, well, let's see, can he do it? Ooh, that's not good. Uh, let's look especially here at, um, fiddle, it didn't do it for me. Um, verse 9, First Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The tribulation, the literal seven-year great tribulation, is God meeting out his wrath, on the unbelieving, on the wicked. God is sent, Christ comes back at the end of that to right the wrongs of the world. He comes back as a lion with a broadsword in his hand. What a thing that is. And so that is not prepared for the church. He's delivering us from that, delivering us from here before it. God has not destined us for wrath. Uh, so that's very important for us as we look at this. As we evaluate, I'll tell you one thing that I find, and I tried to, to express it to you last week. In all the many, many commentators that I read, and in, in the many commenta commentaries that I own, I have to set aside a lot of good men that I really respect when I get to a passage like this, because they have a, a different view of the end times. We described it in detail. Last week we were somewhat, we kind of had a little bit of a systematic theology lesson. 
where we talked about being dispensational, pre-tribulational, and pre-rapture. Uh, we believe there is literally a thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. We believe that that comes after a literal great tribulation of seven years, and we believe that that comes after the literal rapture of Christ's church. All living believers at the time of the rapture meet the Lord in the air. We gave you a timeline where it didn't so G show Jesus returning at the rapture. The rapture and the second coming are distinct. It showed Jesus coming down and going back up. We meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 told us, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so we, I give you this much to work with. I gave you what I gave you in writing last week. You can find it on YouTube, etc. if you want to dig into it a little bit. Uh, and if you want what we gave in writing, we can help you get a hold of that. Uh, we can send it to you. Anyway, if you want to dig a little bit in that, what you realize is this. We have to filter what we read, not from God's Word necessarily, but what we read about God's Word based on does it have the right outlook. And one of the places where good people differ is on the millennium. If this is the kingdom, then it's our job to make the world a better place. So we better really rethink ourselves and get much, much, much more social and much less evangelistic. Because the kingdom is going to come later, according to Scripture. This isn't it. It is not our number one priority to make the world a better place. It is our number one priority to show people the way of salvation through Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. Amen? It is not our purpose to polish the brass in the ballroom on the Titanic. It is our purpose to take people to the lifeboat of salvation. And we need to be very careful. Do we do things socially? Sure we do. We, we give away food to people in, in the church and outside of the church. We have a heart for homeless veterans. We bring clothes and, and toiletries and all kinds of things for homeless vets for the whole month of February. Last year, the, the quarantine happened at the end of that, and we weren't able to deliver that stuff forever. Uh, it, it took up a lot of space here at church. A reminder of how generous God's people were. What a joy. But our main purpose is the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And we need to be reminded of it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The day of the Lord, good for some and bad for others. Uh, Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, verse 1, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. So here you see it, to bring good news to the afflicted, bind the brokenhearted, liberty to the captives, freedom to the prisoners, proclaim the favorable, favorable year of the Lord. That's favorable, it's a wonderful thing, the return of God to right the wrongs. And the day of vengeance of our God. Whether it's wonderful or terrible has everything to do with if we're ready for it or not ready for it. If we are born again, if we have trusted Christ as our Savior, or if we've not. That's all there is to it. Uh, that's the dividing line. Also in Isaiah, back in chapter 13, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore all hands will fall and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment. Their face is aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it, from the star, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless." Uh, it has two sides to it, and they are profound. Uh, let's talk about the man of lawlessness. Uh, the man of lawlessness has many names. Uh, he's called here the man of lawlessness. I believe wholeheartedly that he is the beast of Daniel and of Revelation. Uh, I would say he's the little horn with the big mouth back in Daniel. Uh, we, we talked about that a few years back in Daniel's visions. 
um, there was uh, a beast with many horns, and that horn, one horn took out all the other horns. It was a little horn, but it boasted great things. The little horn with the big mouth, uh, that's the man of lawlessness. He speaks of him here as the man, it's literally, uh, the King James says, son of perdition. Uh, New American Standard says at the end of verse 3, son of destruction. This son of destruction, son of perdition, is only used of one other person in Scripture. It's in John 17 in Jesus' high priestly prayer. He uses it to talk about Judas Iscariot, the man doomed to destruction. Uh, he, he speaks of him that it was better for him that he had never been born, the man that was doomed to destruction. So the beast of Revelation, of Daniel, the man of lawlessness here of Second Thessalonians, the same person, and we know of this person uh, that um, he is um, doomed to destruction as the son of perdition. Uh, he believe he is also the Antichrist. Uh, scripture tells us in the book of John, uh, John says that even now there are many Antichrists. The Antichrist is coming, but even now there are many Antichrists. In a sense, there's small a and big A. Uh, in this, all I mean by that is this, none of them are deity, don't mistake that. But Antichrist is anything that's against Christ. Any person that's against Christ, any teaching or movement that's against Christ is Antichrist. And we have a lot of Antichrists around us now, we don't have to look very far. But there will come a day where there will be one specific man who will be obvious and known to history, who we will understand is the Antichrist, the beast, the beast from the sea, the man of lawlessness. This is not Satan, and our passage will bear that out, but he comes in the power of Satan to do the work of Satan. He is not Satan, but he is Satan's minister, his servant, if you will, doing his will. Um, he will be revealed. The word that's used of revealed is he will, it will be profound and unmistakable. We're not given to know exactly when that revelation will be. I give you a couple suggestions here in your notes. Uh, perhaps some will recognize him for who he is when he makes a covenant with the world at the beginning of the tribulation. And people have spent time, there's new names I hear now about maybe this person is the Antichrist. Uh, I remember as a little kid in Christian school in the 70s, hearing that I had teachers that were convinced that Henry Kissinger was going to be the Antichrist? I guess not. Uh, we, we try to take current events and Bible prophecy and meld them, and it's a very, very, very inexact science, and I think it's meant to be uh, in that respect. But when he comes, the world will know him for who he is. Whether they know it when he makes a covenant with the whole world at the beginning of the tribulation, and so you see this, the, the church all of a sudden disappears. The rapture is going to happen faster than I can snap my fingers. And all those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior are going to meet the Lord in the air and be heaven bound. We're headed up for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're, lamb, we're going to trade in the old body for the new one. Incredible, exciting stuff. Think of the world that's left behind. I don't know how much time you've spent looking at the public school system of the United States of America, but let me tell you, it's not what Thomas Jefferson wanted it to be when he, made it, when he started the ball rolling. It's not what it was when my dad was in the school. It's not what it would have been in my day in the school. It's rapidly different. Secular humanism has filled the void where we took God out of the school Secular humanism, the worship of man, and man decides the rights and the wrongs, which is a pretty wishy-washy kind of a thing, that has inundated the school system. And it's picked up speed. Here's why. There's become less and less and less Christians teaching in the school. And there's been less and less Christian kids sitting in the classroom. We, we have folks in our church that have, have been uh, wonderful teachers and administrators in the public school system through the years, uh, but I don't think we have anybody in our church who's currently teaching in the public school. Uh, we might have some teachers age, et cetera, around here in our greater church family, but that's about it. Uh, there are still some Christians in the public school, but nothing like there used to be. Uh, I remember as a little kid, and I remember when my boys were little kids, and we were in western New York in a very small uh, we sent our kids to public school, and it was like no public school you ever see. 
uh, it's really, it was really quite something. And part of that was there were several believers on the staff. But by and large, that's gone. And so it's only going to get worse. That's kind of the nature of it. But imagine, if you will, a world without a Christian in it. A world without a Bible believer in it. A world without a Christian with a Christian worldview in it. The whole world. Dear friend, this world is going to go to pot very, very quickly when the Lord takes his believing folks out of it. It's going to be a frightening day. Um, We'll talk about the deceptions there as well, but he's going to make this firm covenant with the many, with the world, for one week. Remember, the week is a, a seven of years, is how this is used. This, this is the last, this is the 70th week of Daniel's 70-week prophecy uh, that we've looked at in detail in days gone by. The second part of Daniel 9.27, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction... One that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. In other words, he is going to break his covenant when it comes to the middle. At the three and a half year point, at the middle of the exact middle of the seven year tribulation, he's going to break his covenant and it's going to be a royal mess. And so if people don't know who he is before, they're going to know who he is when he breaks his covenant. It's going to be crystal clear that this is the beast. This is the Antichrist. Um... Again, it will be profound and unmistakable. Uh, notice here in our passage, this son of destruction, this man of lawlessness, verse 4, opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. He opposes God and every so-called God or object of worship, and he exalts himself over God and every so-called God or object of worship. I find it interesting here that not only does he takes God, take God's place and squeeze God out of worship, out of the equation of worship, he takes the place of any and everything in person who's worshipped. So the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and his word, that's set aside, but every false god, Confucius, Buddha, Allah, on and on and on it goes, all of them are going to be set aside, the Antichrist is going to put himself in that place, he is going to take the place of God or the gods. He alone is going to be the focus of worship. That's his goal. He self-promotes. He sets himself up as the only one to be worshipped. Uh, if you have to tell people to worship you uh, who wouldn't otherwise worship you, maybe there's something wrong in that. You know, There's a wonderful proverb, let another praise you and not your own lips. Uh, he's a self-promoter. He places himself in God's seat within God's temple. Uh, what is that temple? Well, it could be a new temple. There, you notice here in our, in our passage a moment ago, uh, in Daniel, it talks about the offering, the grain offering, the sacrifices made. There's a renewed. We talked about it, forgive me, I'm making a lot of references back to what we just did last week. Uh, it was very much foundational. Uh, again, you can find it in your email, uh, you can get the YouTube link, you can get the notes, etc. But we believe in a parenthetical church age. Daniel was given a prophecy of 70 weeks. There was a 7 week period and then a 69 week or 62 week period adding up to 69 and there's one week left undone that hasn't happened yet. We understand that in the language the week is a group of 7. You and I only really use that one way. We have, a, we have a Sabbath or a seven of days is a week. But a week is a group of sevens, and so we understand it to mean to them that it is a Sabbath of years and that a week is, or that each of these weeks is representing years, a group of seven years each time. And so the first group of seven years, that's the actual rebuilding of Jerusalem, of the temple and of the walls. Uh, completed when Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the, the, the letters that let him go to the cedars of Lebanon and get his wood and go in, uh, have free passage to get to Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And so that's where that mark happens and we start to count from. And so from the decree of Artaxerxes, we have the first seven, uh, and that is the rebuilding 
of Jerusalem over that 49 year period, seven sevens. And then we have 62, well that, you add them both together, it gives us 483 out of 490 years. If you go from the decree of Artaxerxes and you mark the years that way, you come exactly to the day to Palm Sunday, to when Jesus Christ was presented to the world, to Jerusalem, to Israel as the king. Meek and lowly and riding on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey, the scripture tells us. This was the presentation of Jesus. And they received him as they should have, didn't they? They threw their outer robes down so his donkey didn't have to put his hooves on the dirty old dirt. They threw palm fronds down. They sang from one side of the road to the other back and forth, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. They sang his praises literally and beautifully. But just a few short day late, days later, they cried, crucify him, crucify him, release unto us Barabbas. And so from the day the decree of Jerusalem until Messiah be cut off, that 69 weeks, 483 years. There's one year left, and that's this tribulation of which we speak. And Scripture points us right to it. Again, from the day of Pentecost, not long after the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, until the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, when we meet the Lord in the air, we see that as a parenthetical statement. God's timeline has been Israel-centered, and it will be Israel-centered again. In the meantime, it's the church. It's all about the New Testament church. But there's a day coming when the New Testament church is going to go heavenward in the twinkling of an eye, and God's going to deal with Israel. Does that mean they're going to have a renewed system of worship, even of sacrifice, and a renewed temple? Perhaps it does. It, perhaps that's the temple and the seat of the temple that Antichrist is going to take over and aspire to. Uh, is it the head of the church, if you will? Uh, again, I think we have a lot of church equaling Israel issues there. I don't personally think it's the head of the church. It could also literally be the hearts of men because Paul is pretty quick to tell us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that's within us. Whatever the case, wherever it is, whether it's a literal throne in Jerusalem, whether it's the head of some international one world church, or whether it's in the hearts of men, Antichrist, this minister of Satan, is going to take the place of God and of any God, small g, or any other object of worship. Of all the things that men worship, Antichrist is going to put himself above all of those. He's going to install himself in the place of God. You think about it, the height of sin is placing oneself in or above the place of God. Isaiah 14, verse 14, we have the culmination of all of the I wills of Satan. Satan says, I will ascend, I will this, I will that. And then he, at the peak of it all, he says this in verse 14, I will make myself like the Most High. He wanted the place of God, and that is the height of sin for any being other than God, the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul tells them, he he's refers to previous instruction. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Which is really pretty remarkable because Paul's time in Thessalonica was very brief. Um, I, you know me, I'm somewhat guilty. I have not preached Revelation. People have wanted me for 14 plus years to preach on Revelation and I haven't done it. And if I have, it was the letters to the seven churches and it wasn't anything apocalyptic and juicy. People want revelation. Uh, I have preached on Daniel. Uh, I have taught a class on Daniel while I was here. Um, well, actually, I did Daniel Sunday, mor Sunday evening way back when, and then Sunday mornings uh, just, I think, three years ago. And so we've looked at a lot of end times through Daniel, and here we are in First and Second Thess Thessalonians looking at end times. But if you've been here, most of you, many of you, for that period of time, you know I haven't put a lot of emphasis on prophecy. Uh, it's, it's been the meat and potatoes of how to know the Lord and how to live for the Lord. Uh, we've spent time Old Testament and New, but not a lot in those end time prophecies. Uh, maybe I'm a little challenged by this is what I'm telling you. Paul had a period of weeks with the Thessalonian church in person, and he talked to them about end times already. And so we need to make room for it. Here we are doing it in Thessalonians. Don't hold your breath in Revelation. It's coming, but 
I wouldn't want you to pass out or anything. Um, there's going to be a restraint, or there is a restraint of lawlessness. Look at verse 6. And you know what restrains him? That's the man of lawlessness now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out oops, <laughs> of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. Uh, we'll have to come back to that. Uh, but uh, this restraint, they knew. You know, verse 6, what restrains him now. Uh, they knew. The interesting thing is, in the language of this text, it's not crystal clear of whom, the Lord, whom or what the Lord is speaking. He says he, he's neuter. You know what restrains him now. And then a little bit later, he's going to use a masculine pronoun, he restrains him. And so, is it a, is it, a it or is it a who? Um, it's not crystal clear. That's the nature of this. Uh, verse 7b, the masculine pronoun he is used indicating the restrainer is a person. It's not obvious. Uh, my mindset is that the Holy Spirit best fits the profile. Uh, we know that he is the restrainer of sin in general, and here I think that would uh, agree with this, the restrainer of lawlessness. Uh, God has his hands on the world. We're, we're held together that way, you know. Spiritually, God has his hands on things, and for things to get very, very bad very, very quickly, all God has to do is let go. It's a terrifying place. A terrifying time. If God pulls his hands away and takes a step back. Think about Saul and David. They both sinned. They both disappointed God. They both sinned publicly and privately. But Saul, his sins were a little more bold-faced. He was trying too much to take authority away from God and make it his own. Sin number one. And Saul did not make things right with the Lord like King David did. Scripture calls David a man after God's own heart. It says that in all of his ministry, he didn't sin except in the matter of Bathsheba and Uriah. Well, let's be honest. David sinned plenty. God said, don't count those people. Don't number your, don't, don't take a, an inventory of your chariots or your people. And he did it. There are several other times that David failed the Lord. My suggestion to you is what it's always been. There were times other than Uriah and Bathsheba where David made it right with the Lord right away. But he went nine, almost ten months before he got right with the Lord about his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. Saul didn't come to the Lord. We don't have any psalms that are written by Saul where he's on his knees before the Lord, pouring out his heart in contrition. We have two wonderful psalms of David where the whole Psalms are contrition, especially after Bathsheba. Uh, what happened to Saul is the Lord let Saul get to his third strike, and he took his Holy Spirit out of Saul. In the Old Testament, the Spirit came and went. Not every Old Testament believer had the Holy Spirit within him or her. The Holy Spirit came and went. The Holy Spirit was there to do a supernatural service. Some of that's kind of interesting. The, the craftsmen that made, that made the first temple were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, even God knows if you want the job done right, you've got to do it yourself. Uh, imagine, you know, I've seen what man can, can think about and man can do with his hands. Imagine man with the Holy Spirit's empowerment and wisdom, what he can do. Whew, must have been incredible, that temple. Uh, he filled Samson. The secret of Samson's strength was not in his muscles. It was because he didn't have enough muscles on him to do the supernatural things he did. What was the secret? The secret was the Holy Spirit was within him. But when God took his Holy Spirit out of Saul, Saul was a lost boy in the worst sense of that. He was in such a mess, he went to the witch of Endor, a medium, to conjure up the soul of Samuel so that he could talk to Samuel and get advice because he no longer had God's Spirit within him to guide him. God had backed away and taken his hands off. The worst thing that can happen in the world or in a person is for God uh, to take his hands away. And so the man of lawlessness is restrained for a time, uh, but there's going to come a day where that restrainer is going to let go. 
Uh, lawlessness is alive and well today, but it's not as bad as it could be or as it's going to be. Notice the empowerment of the man of lawlessness. Forgive me while I flick through a bunch here again. Um, in verse 9, that is, the one who's coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all the power and signs and false wonders. The man of lawlessness, Antichrist's work is in step with the desires of Satan. His coming is in accord with Satan's power and Satan's desires. His work is supernatural. It is not from God. His work is empowered by Satan himself. Uh, notice here in our passage, all power and signs and false wonders. We are in a bad way if we don't stop to ponder the fact that Satan is real. That Satan has many fallen angels. About a third of the angels of heaven fell with, took their choice and followed Satan out of heaven in his rebellion. Uh, he has his minions to do his work. He has a limited number of them. They can't be everywhere at the same time. He has to put them where it works best for him. Uh, but he has power. He does not have all power. He does not have God's power. But he has astounding, supernatural, other than human power. Satan and his demons have some sense of the future. The, de the demon that said to Christ at Gadara, Why are you here, son of the Most High God? He knew Jesus personally. Why are you here to torment us before the time? He knew his end wasn't there yet. Why was Jesus there already? Uh, Acts 16, the young lady that Paul and Silas cast a demon out of, she had the power to predict the future, and, and her owners, two men that owned her, were making wonderful money, you know, probably you know, in their version of the stock market or the commodities market, uh, knowing what the future held, made them all kinds of money. So Satan has those sorts of power, and he's going to give that power to Antichrist. We are reminded that evil spirits exist and that there is an unseen battle raging continually. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. There is a spiritual battle that we don't see, but it's very, very real. And we need to give credit to the other side and realize how powerful they are. And we need to be very close to the Lord and take on that armor of God, the salvation and faith and the word of God. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The demise of the man of lawlessness uh, in our Thessalonians passage. Oops. Um, there we go. I just put the wrong address at the top. I'm sorry. Um, Notice here his description that the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth. It's interesting. I, I like doing block outlines. It's, I won't take the time to describe it, but I use the tab button and, and I put clauses underneath one another, you know, the dependent clauses under the clause that they're working with and so forth. And it's, it's kind of neat to see things that way. It really helps me uh, get an eye on the structure of a passage. Uh, but... Um, this is one of the descriptions. Who is this lawless man? He is the one that the Lord will destroy with the breath of his mouth. So even as it describes him and defines him, it defines his demise. God is going to destroy him with the breath of his mouth. He's more powerful than any of us could deal with, but to God, snuff him. Snuff him out with a breath, like a little bitty candle flame, and it's gone. Uh, that's what's going to happen to him. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Notice here, and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. As God enters, Satan exits. Satan's man exits. That's the nature of it. The Lord's coming. We'll see, we'll see to that by itself. 
Notice here as we look at our last point, the deception of the unbelieving, verses 10 through 12. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will, not, so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. Um, those who perish do so because they didn't receive the love of the truth. Uh, this deception has its origin in Satan, but we realize also in clear uh, wording here that the Lord is going to bring a deluding influence so that they will believe they'll fall for what is false. This is after the Lord is rep has raptured his church away, uh, this is at the very end of time. Uh, you know, when you, you work in a secular workplace and you find friends, sometimes you find friends that are spiritually minded or, or would maybe call themselves Christians or certainly would say that they believe in God and, and things like that. And sometimes you find people that you, you find friends with people that have some sense of God in a secular world and it's kind of precious to you. When Kim and I were young and married and living out in Ohio, I was teaching in a Christian school. She was working in a bank. And there was one lady there that she got to be friends with, and she and her husband were Seventh-day Adventists. And right before we left, we had them to dinner, and I was really amazed at some of the things he said about their belief structure. The most amazing thing that he said was this. At the end of time, all of humanity, presently living and from years gone by, all of humanity is going to be reanimated and they're going to have an opportunity to walk past Jesus, to look at Jesus, and to decide if they believe in Jesus or not. I can find no scripture at all, and it doesn't agree with scripture, particularly this passage. To be honest, it would be delightful we all grieve for people we've lost and we're not sure of their salvation. But would it be fair? Would it be righteous? Would it be true? If at the end of time, after not believing in what they couldn't see, which is what our salvation is, God says to doubting Thomas, you see and you believe, how wonderfully blessed are they who having not seen yet believe. That is the gospel. I'm believing in Jesus, the Son of God whom I cannot see, whom I know only by God's word, I'm believing in him that he, the perfect righteous son of God, took on completely human form, and because he was human, he was able to die for me, to leave my sins buried behind him, and to raise in victory over sin, over death, and over the grave, and over hell. That is salvation. Believing in what I cannot see, that is what faith is. And so how could that be righteous for God to say, hey, here's your one last chance, look at him and believe. Does it take any faith to believe in what you're seeing? Not like it does to believe in what you're not seeing. Radical difference. A deluding influence. Remember this. In the story of the flood, which is something of a picture of our salvation in broad terms, for 120 years Noah built that ark and people came and said, what you doing? They'd never seen a boat before. They'd never felt a pouring rain before. They woke up to a, a dew every morning, and then it was gone. It was kind of like San Francisco Bay Area when I was a kid. Ten months of the year, you'd wake up, it'd be 55 degrees, it'd be a little bit misty, and by the end of the day, it'd be between 75 and 80 with a clear blue sky. That's just how it was most of the year. Rainy season, January, February. Other than that, that's just how it was. That was kind of their world. They didn't know what rain looked like. They'd never been to oceans. They'd never been to great seas. They didn't know what a boat was for. No, what you doing? And he told them, repent, get right. God's going to destroy the world by flood. The water's going to come down from above and up from below. And if you're not in this boat, you're not going to be saved. And for 120 years, they laughed him to scorn. This crazy nut, what's he even talking about? A boat. What is a boat? And then the day came, and the rains came down, and the floods came up. Dear friend, remember this. It was not Noah, his wife, his sons, nor his daughters-in-law, none of the eight humans, and none of the thousands of animals on that ship closed the door. It was Almighty God who closed the door. 
there was a time to believe, there was a time to make a change, there was a time to repent. And when that time was, plat, was passed, the door shut. And when it shut, it was fixed, and there was nothing anybody outside or inside could do about it. It was God who shut the door. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We cannot assume a tomorrow. We do ourselves an incredible disservice if we do. We cannot assume for others a tomorrow. We need to share the gospel message. We need to believe the gospel message before it's eternally too late. Father, thank you for your word. We pray that you would impress it upon our hearts. We pray earnestly, Lord, if there's one here today that hasn't trusted Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior, Lord, that they come to realize what a wonderful thing it is, what wonderful provision you've made, and that, Lord, they would delight to see the offer from your hand of eternal salvation simply by faith that your Son came as the Bible said he did, that he died on Calvary's cross, and that he rose again as the Bible said he did. And Father, may all of us be quick to share that word with a lost and dying world. Uh, Lord, we look at frightening things in the future, but we realize, Lord, in you the fright is gone. In you there's salvation and fullness of joy forevermore. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, we're going to sing um, yep. Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Uh, let's stand together as we sing. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the day. Thank you for your word. Dear Lord, may it be impressed upon our hearts. May it mold and shape us uh, after your will. Uh, may we be quick to share your gospel message. May we hold on to it tightly personally. We love you, Lord, and thank you for what you've done, and we trust you for what you will do. And we pray that you dismiss us with your blessing. Keep us safe until we see one another again. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat>